Okay, hi. Let's talk about all the books I read in June. So, gonna go in chronological order of when I finished them, starting with Ghosts of Gold Mountain, the epic story of the Chinese who built the Transcontinental Railroad by Gordon H. Chang. So this is um, a very, not a niche book. It is a book that has a kind of small target in what it's trying to talk about, um, which is the Chinese who built the railroad, um, the, the transcontinental railroad in the US, I should say. Now, um, one of the flaws of this book, which is something that the author himself brings up in the intro, is that there are zero firsthand accounts by Chinese laborers on what it was like to build the railroad, zero. This author is an academic. He has um, dug through archives. He has looked through um, historical, like he has done his due diligence as an academic to try to hunt these down in the US and in China, where there was, there's also potential um, historical remnants via letters that may have been written. And he could find none. So um, this book and the story of the Chinese laborers has to be told via other sources, and those sources convey a white gaze for the most part. So when you look at like the historical um, like the sources um, from the companies that the companies that hired them, or of the um, papers that wrote about them, um, you kind of get you get a sense of the white gaze, but you also get a sense of um, what's missing. Based, like you 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 can tell through what they don't say. So, as an example. Um, they don't know the names of a majority of the Chinese laborers that worked for the railroad companies because they didn't actually hire them directly. They would get a um, individual who was Chinese who would go out and find Chinese labor and they would pay that person and then that person would pay the laborers who kind of reported to him. It was um, not like actual legitimate subcontracting, but that was the way that they paid laborers. Um, so you have like the written uh, history, and then you have some of the history, uh, uh, like archeological history, where these laborers were in labor camps for like pretty long periods of time sometimes, because a lot of this work was being done in the, in the Sierra Nevadas in California, which uh, were very grueling, and it took quite a bit of time to actually do the labor. Um, and so what you saw um, them staying in places for very long periods of time, and they did not clean up well after themselves. So there are like remnants of litter, I guess, that they left behind. Um, and that kind of paints some sort of story as well. I guess like the um, content of the book is okay. Um, I think it was a bit long for the amount of information that the author had. Um, it was a lot of approximating and sometimes like, you know, knowing how other um, Chinese people within the United States were living and trying to like kind of um, parallel that to the way the laborers might live. Um, there was a lot about the um, actual um, owners of the railroad company and like the things that they put in writing. There's like the some inclusion of them in pictures that were taken at the time or lack of inclusion in some cases that were kind of helped to formulate an idea. Um, but it w it's really hard to write about the experience of Chinese laborers um, without having a single primary source. So a bit long for what it was, um, it was it, but it was an okay read. Then I read Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. So um, I've read all of R.F. Kuang's 
books at this point. Um, I read the Poppy War trilogy, and then earlier this year, I read Babel. Um, and then I came to Yellow Face, knowing it was going to be a completely different take. Both of her others were fantasy, while the Poppy War trilogy is um, a, like a straight up fantasy, like a grim dark fantasy. Uh, the Babel was much more of a historical novel that had like fantastic elements put into the historic setting. Um, and Yellow Face was more of a satirical horror novel, so this follows, um, it's first person and it's very conversational in its tone, and you're following a girl that has always been second best to her friend, and her friend is Asian, and, um, she, uh, it's kind of more of like a, maybe a frenemy situation, and um, she is just constantly jealous of this friend and is jealous of her um, when they are together, when they're not together. And it paints a lot of, it paints the way that she sees this friend. And then something happens to this friend and she gets a hold of her manuscript. And then she questions, can I take this manuscript as my own? And that's where the name of the book, Yellow Face, comes in. Now, this book has a lot of, like, I guess, more immediate commentary on Twitter and social media and the relationship between author and work, the, like, what defines plagiarism, um, uh, white authors writing, um, not just white authors, but, like, I guess, authors writing um, from like writing characters that are not like them in some capacity. So a white, white author writing an Asian character or a Vietnamese author writing a Korean character. The book becomes very meta um, around these topics. And so much so that at times I couldn't tell if I couldn't tell how, I guess my issue while I was reading it and after reading it is I couldn't tell how intentionally R.F. Kuang wrote herself into this book as the um, Asian protagonist. I can't think of her name. I, I forget both of the, <laughs> the protagonist's names. Um, she is an author who got success immediately, like R.F. Kuang, um, who has a big social media presence, like R.F. Kuang, who then tries to write something completely different in like her next novels after seeing her success, like R.F. Kuang. It, it's, it becomes a kind of manner of like, how much of her is she putting in this character and putting in this commentary? And if she is, is it super intentional, which I think it is, but like, I don't know what I'm trying to convey. Like, like, do I like that? I guess. Like, do I like the idea of being super meta um, with it? I don't know. It Like, sometimes I did, but it kind of, I guess it teetered on the edge of like too meta. Um, especially since I know about the author because I'm not like a diehard follower, but I have followed her journey in some capacity. So I know how much it feels like self-insertion into the narrative. And even if that's intentional, I don't know if that's something that I personally really enjoy. Um, from the reviews that I saw, I didn't really anticipate this to be like a satirical horror novel, um, which I did appreciate. It gave me the vibes of like a touch of Jen in some regard like that, where it's like this kind of literary novel that has like these really weird horror elements that get put in. I liked this more than I liked to touch a Jen. And overall, I thought it was it was an interesting novel. I was intrigued the entire time, I guess. I was consistently wanting to pick it up and I finished it in a matter of 24 hours. So um, I obviously enjoyed it in some capacity. Uh, it just, it wasn't a favorite for me. Okay, and then I finished 
the Tawny Man trilogy by Robin Hobb. I finished Fool's Fate. Um, this was, I think, one of my favorite books through the entirety of the Realm of the Elderling so far, and this is my ninth book no, 10th book I've read in that series because I did read one novella. You can kind of see the parallels of Robin, like Tawny Man trilogy to the first trilogy, the Farseer trilogy. And the Farseer trilogy has Assassin's Quest at the end, which is a quest novel, but it is very slow and its pacing is kind of all over the place. Um, and for that reason, a lot of people don't enjoy it as much. I did enjoy Assassin's Quest, but kind of the, um, the troubles that I think Robin Hobb had with conveying a quest novel like that, when she did it again and kind of paralleled it in Fool's Fate, it was quite well done in my opinion. I thought that you got a lot of good character moments, like you had a lot of good character dynamics um, between people. You saw like relationships get better, relationships become more rocky. You had like a pretty consistent pace and pushing forward of the narrative. You cover, like there was a lot of scope of place that got covered. And it always felt like there was a pretty nice and substantial momentum to the novel without it feeling like rushed. Um, and then it has quite a bit of, after you know some of the climatic moments in the book, it has quite a bit of character resolution um, that occurs. Uh, and I think that um, the first maybe 80 to 90% of the book I preferred to the last 10%. There was um, a decision made with where to change the focal point of um, relationships and characters that I personally didn't think was like very earned. Um, and uh, there were other character moments that I would have personally been more interested in seeing. But overall, um, I loved it. Um, and I have already started the next series, which is the Rain Wild Chronicles. Okay, and then I just like went total wild card, um, Escape by R.A. Montgomery. So um, I had some family in town. We were walking around downtown Albany and we came across a free little or a little free library. Um, and in it was a choose your own adventure book from the 80s called, Mont um, called Escape. And in it you're in, um, it's not that far into the future, um, let me see, because I just thought it was funny. Yeah, you're in the year 2035, um, and the United States is no longer the United States. There was civil war that caused it to break into three different um, countries, and you are in enemy territory, and you have to get out. Um, it was, I did a bunch of different endings, like I kept restarting and just seeing which trajectory, like where different trajectories took me. Um, it was, it was fun, it was enjoyable enough. It's definitely made for kids in the 80s. Um, your, <laughs> I think it's funny how like, you, I could choose a path and um, then I can choose like a totally different path. Like it will give me two options. And I chose one and something horrible happened in the book ended and then I chose another and like it didn't consider this like character motivation that came up in this one at all and everything went fine. Um, so there's definitely no consistency in like the way the, these endings occurred. Um, but I had fun with it for like a good hour or so. So yeah, that was a way to spend a night. Then I read A Flicker in the Dark by Stacey Willingham. This is a thriller and it is about a woman who is a psychologist who just got engaged and um, you see like some tensions occurring in that relationship with her fiance and also with her brother who she's very close with who doesn't really approve of the relationship because they haven't been dating in his opinion for very long. 
Um, then you start to see a string of murders that occur, and they are very reminiscent of a string of murders that occurred years ago, where your protagonist's father turned out to be the serial killer. So it seems like there might be a copycat on the loose. Overall, not a super groundbreaking book, but uh, I did enjoy it enough that I kept going through and completed it. So haven't picked up a thriller and actually finished it in quite a long time. Um, but yeah, the kind of motivations and uh, intrigued me and the kind of protagonist begins to unravel in a way that makes sense to me. So yeah, overall, I thought it was an enjoyable enough book. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a book that I technically finished in July, but I read a majority of it in June. Um, and that is The Night Watch by Sarah Waters. So this is my fifth Sarah Waters of six that she currently has published. This one is, I think, in scope, unlike others of hers that I've picked up. So in this, you, um, and kind of in narrative structure too, in this, you have multiple, I guess, protagonists. And um, you start in the year 1947 in London, um, so uh, after World War II. And you are seeing these characters' lives. It's a lot of people maybe in their early 20s or mid-20s. You're seeing these characters' lives. You're following Viv, who works with Helen. And, um, and Helen is um, dating and living with uh, Julia, and Viv is having an affair with a married man, and um, Viv's brother Duncan is working a kind of dead-end job and living with this old man. And then there is Kay, who... Um, you don't really know too much about other than she has a decent amount of money. She lives like as a paying guest at this man's house, um, a man's house. And there are some connections that you see between characters at this point, um, but it's uh, very, it's kind of undeveloped and you don't really know where it's going to go, but then it pulls you back in time um, to the year I want to say 1940, maybe I'll track. I don't remember. I can't find it easily, and I listened to this book on audio. I want to say it was 1944, maybe. Um, the war is kind of in full swing. Um, and you begin to see a bit more of the characters, um, their relationships with one another. You see more of the the connections between those specific people and uh, kind of where they were at during the war. And then you again jump back this time to 1941 and you, uh, you're you not in 1941 for nearly as long. A bulk of the work takes place in the war and you kind of see the start of these relationships. I think the structure of this book is a lot of what kind of makes it intriguing um when you normally when i see like multiple timelines you're kind of always going back and forth or you kind of like loop back around to your first one but this one she really leaves you at the beginning one thing that i think that she does really well with the structure that i think that a lot of people would struggle with is conveying enough information without overloading you with it like the perspective um the, the connections between where the characters are in, and then back to where they were, she never like paints like a direct line um, and spells everything out for you. And I think that like there's some things that I didn't completely understand, which I found to be intentional and I quite liked. Um, I think that in another author's hands, there would be a lot of over explaining that would occur. Um, I think that the choice of going backwards, the first time we took that step back, I was not super intrigued with where we landed with characters. I thought some of 
the scenes that kind of conveyed like where they're at right now were a bit more extended than they needed to be. And so it took me a while in part two to really like wrap myself into the narrative. Um, but yeah, overall, I thought it was a solid book. Um, I don't think Sarah Waters can really write anything bad. Um, I only have one of her books left. And that is um, The Little Stranger, which I've heard is her only one that doesn't have queer elements to it. So we will see how that goes because I always find um, I am drawn to her books for like the lesbian elements to them. I think that another thing that I like I noticed with Sarah Waters characters is like this immediacy of of emotion that they feel like there's such an immediacy to the way that they describe pain or pleasure um or like their comfortability or discomfort in a situation or relationship or yeah or a relationship that feels like very raw and vulnerable and um it's it's a way that i don't really experience emotion like it's so different from how I interpret and see the world that it's always interesting to kind of read something that's so different than the way you you perceive the world around you um so yeah that is the last book I started in June finished in July um but wanted to include in this so that I didn't forget anything I wanted to talk about with that book but that is all I got I would love to hear what books you read in June and until next time, happy reading.